In this video, I'm going to be going through composition of functions and what the idea of a composition of a function is. I have my input variable x and then I'm going to do something to that. That's going to be my function. And then I'm going to do another thing to that. Okay. What we're going to be doing is taking functions and putting them inside of functions. So what we're going to do today is we're going to evaluate a function composition, which is where we're taking a number, performing a function on it, and then performing a function on that resulting number. We're going to be doing that with tables, graphs, and equations or formulas. Then if I give you two functions, just in abstraction, you should be able to properly compose one with the other, put one on the inside of the other. Then if I gave you a function composition, if I told you there was a function composition that took place, you should be able to tell me the functions I used for that composition. So think of it as working backwards. So there's two popular notations for composition of functions. I really, really, really like this notation because I feel like it's the most intuitive. What I'm saying is I start with X, and then I G that function. I take X, I perform the operations associated with G on it. And then I take that thing and use that as my input for F, where I perform the associated operations um, with F on that resulting um, thing, whether that be a, a number or whether that be an equation or whatever. So you could always think of it as outer of inner of X. So another piece of notation I want to address is this one here. I'm not thrilled about it. It's F O G of X. Think of G as the inside function. A way you could think about it is by making a weird O like this. And where students get confused with this notation is sometimes they will forget what's on the outside and what's on the inside. Think of it like this. This weird O, you could think of this as two parentheses. Take this parenthesis and crank it out here. And then you get the notation that makes sense. Okay. So let's just do a theoretical example here. Go ahead and pause the video and uh, solve this problem. Okay, what you were asked to do was to uh, contextually understand what m of j of five was. Okay, so <clears throat> the outer of the inner function here is what we're looking at. So what does j of five mean? j of five means the weight of five passengers. If I put five passengers into the car, how many joules is required? Then I consider my M, M of the weight of five passengers. The input is now the weight of five passengers. The output is gonna be the gas mileage of the car required, okay? Now, suppose you have C of S, that's gonna give you the number of calories burned doing sit-ups, and S of T gives the number of sit-ups a person can do in T minutes. Go ahead and interpret C of S of three. Pause the video and do this. Okay, what you should have come up with was first discerning that S of three is the number of sit-ups possible in three minutes. Next, C is the number of sit-ups possible in three minutes, and I'm gonna be, or that's the input now. So now I'm gonna do C of that, which means the number of calories burned given the number of sit-ups done in three minutes. Now, let's suppose I gave you two tables and I wanted you to compute f of g of two. The way that you should always go about this is you should start with computing the inner value, in which case the inner value is going to be g of two. That's the thing that's inside of f. So I'm going to look at the orange table and I'm going to find out what the y value is associated with two and I should get zero. Now I'm going to take that zero and plug that into F. So F of G of two is effectively the same thing as saying what's F of zero. 
And so now I go to zero on the T axis and find the associated Y value, which is four. Take the procedure from the last problem and use that here. You need to compute G of F of three. As a reminder, the F of T function is gonna be the orangish red line and G of T is gonna be the blue line. Okay. So first you're gonna compute the inner value, which is F of three. So you go to three on the X axis and you look at the output of the red line and you're gonna get negative one. Now I'm gonna take that negative one and use that as the X value for the blue line. And I should get one as my resulting answer. Now let's consider this in regards to equations you're gonna see that it's not really any different. What I'm trying to compute here is Q of P of negative two. So again, I'm gonna use the same procedure. I'm gonna compute the inner value, which is gonna be P of negative two, which means I'm gonna plug negative two into the function P. So five minus negative two squared. Note the usage of parentheses here. So I get five minus four, that's one. So now what I'm really doing here is I'm asking you to evaluate Q of one. Well, in order to find Q of one, I take one and plug that into the Q equation and I get five. Your final answer should be five. Now let's suppose I do something a little bit more abstract. So I've got these functions and I want to do F of H of X. If you notice, I should end up with something involving an X at this juncture. So I'm gonna start with using H of X as my input. So everywhere I see an X in F, I'm gonna put H of X in its place, which is the equation two X squared minus X minus 11. So now what I'm basically doing here is everywhere I saw an X in F, this equation is copy pasted in there. And so now all I need to do is distribute my negative three and collect up like terms. And I should end up with negative six X squared plus three X plus 35. Now we're gonna do H of F of X, which now means everywhere I see an X in H, I'm going to put this equation in its place. This is a little bit more involving Pause the video and try this on your own. I'll give you a hint. You are going to end up using FOIL, which is your multiplication of binomials. Okay, let's work through this. So everywhere I see an X in H, I'm gonna put the equation three minus two X in its place. So now what I'm gonna address first is this term here. And I'm going to address that separately. So let me go ahead and get that out of the way. Boop. So now I've got three minus two X squared. I have to remember that that's basically writing that binomial twice and I'm going to end up using FOIL. Something I want to really drive home here is there are students who will want to distribute the square to each term. That is absolutely not the case. You may not do that. The only time that's ever possible is if one of the terms in the binomial is zero, which you cannot assume. So I'm going to use FOIL for this. So I do my first, outers, inners, and lasts. Okay. So I collect up my like terms and I end up with nine minus 12 X plus four X squared. Now, if you notice, I didn't use any FOIL for the second f of x that I saw present because I didn't need to. So now what I'm gonna end up doing, and you may not see it here, is I'm gonna distribute the negative, distribute the two, and then collect up my like terms. So I distributed the two here, I distributed the negative here, and now I'm just gonna go ahead and collect up all of the like terms. So what that means is the 18 and the negative 11 and the negative three, those collect up to give me the four, 
the 8x squared, there's nothing it collects up with, so there it goes. And then I've got the negative 24x and the 2x, that's going to collect up to give me the negative 22. If you got 8x squared minus 22x plus 4, you were correct. Now, let's compute these compositions. We're going to start with f of g of x and then g of f of x. Go ahead and pause the video and try the first one here, f of g of x first. Okay, so we've defined f of x and g of x accordingly. What I'm going to do now is put g of x inside of f of x. So I'm going to end up with this line of arithmetic here. Now here's the thing. If you put just this into Lumen, it will be marked correct. And honestly, I would mark it correct. But let's suppose you wanted to perform the expansion. You would write out the binomial twice. You would FOIL, cancel your X's, and collect up your like terms. Either of these answers are completely acceptable and Lumen will accept them. The trick is, if you are going to do the expansion, you have to do it correctly. So if you didn't cancel out these X's or collect this up appropriately, then you'd have a problem. Okay, so if you're going to perform an expansion, make sure that you do it correctly. If you aren't going to perform an expansion, make sure that you express it correctly. All right, now go ahead and do the second composition. This one I think you're going to find is much more straightforward. G of eight or G of f of x. Go ahead and pause the video and try that. So everywhere you see an x in G, just put an x squared in its place. This requires no more simplification. Our problem is complete. Now. Let's suppose we gave you an application problem where we, re we had tax revenue for thousands of people and we had the population in thousands of people was represented by T, the number of years after 2010. What you're asked to do in this problem is find a formula for tax revenue as a function of the year. Go ahead and pause the video and try this. The real trick to this problem was discerning the order of the composition. What needed to happen was I needed to first find out how many people were in the city, and then I could figure out how I would tax them. So what I really did here was I took the function P of T and plugged that into R. So this line of arithmetic here, I think demonstrates exactly how this is supposed to look. Now this is not fully simplified. So what we need to do is substitute P in its place. The, the equation for P. Now, believe it or not, this right here is absolutely a fine answer. This is totally sufficient. You do not have to do any distribution. If you're thinking that you could do some more simplification to this last line, I would encourage you to rethink that. It's not that it's not possible. It's just that it's superfluous. Sometimes simplification doesn't actually bring anything new to a numerical expression. In this course, we're only going to focus on relevant uh, simplification and expansion. I will be outlining exactly what that is as we approach it. I'll tell you now, this response here is absolutely perfect and it demonstrates full knowledge of the content. Now, let's write this function here as a composition of two functions. I realize that with inking, I may have accidentally already given you a hint. Ultimately, what's happening is there's two functions, f and g. And I want to know where, or G and H, I want to know where there's a composition here. If you said G of X was five minus X squared, and you thought of this as F of G, then what you could do is you could say, all right, well, I'll define G as five minus X squared. That means that F now has to be three plus the square root of X. Okay, this is an absolutely fine answer. As a note, there's more than one answer to this. If you're interested in what's called the trivial case, you can send me an email on this one. I would love to answer the question. I think it's, it really blew my mind when I first saw it. So remember, send me an email if you're interested in the trivial case of function composition. Now we're gonna analyze function compositions as it pertains to domain. Let's suppose I have that h of x is the square root of two minus x 
and k of x is 3 over x plus 4. You need to determine the domain of k of h of x. Pause the video and try this on your own. Okay, so first thing you needed to do was actually compute the composition. So everywhere I saw an x in k, I put the equation square root of 2 minus x in its place. This gave me this resulting function, 3 over the square root of 2 minus x plus 4. Now from here, all I need to do is find the domain. The first thing I need to do is remove divisions by 0. Well, in the way of divisions by 0, if this thing here comes out to be 0, I'm taking the square root of 0, that's problematic in a denominator anyway. So I solve for x by adding x to both sides and I get that x is equal to two. That communicates to me that the value two is absolutely removed from my implied domain, which is all real numbers. Now, the next thing I need to consider is the negatives under even indexed radicals. Since I don't see the index of this radical, I assume it to be two, which is an even number, meaning that this value here cannot be negative. In particular, it can't be less than zero. So I add x to both sides or subtract two and divide by negative one, whatever works for you. I find that every value that's greater than two has to be removed from the domain, from my implied domain. So I remove those values. And now I'm gonna go ahead and express my final uh, domain in interval form. The solution is gonna be negative infinity to two parentheses on both uh, endpoints. That's everything for function composition. Um, I encourage you to uh, work into the assignment at this juncture and good luck.